Next on Unsolved Mysteries. When a woman is murdered in a deserted parking lot, her family is convinced that she was killed by her business partner. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Legend says they were gunned down in Bolivia. But some believe that Butch escaped. Two restaurant owners compete for the same customers. One of them winds up dead. And a young boy is tortured and tormented by demonic spirits. Can an exorcism save him? Five compelling cases, some just waiting to be solved. And maybe you hold the key. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Webster, Texas. This much is known. Joan Jeffries died alone and scared in a suburban parking lot. The killer shot her twice in the head at close range. Then he fired two more times. Both bullets pierced her heart. No one has ever been charged with the murder of Joan Jeffries, but her family is sure they know exactly who killed her. A former business partner named Sam Patel. I did not kill Joan. Um, I had no reason to kill Joan. I had no reason whatsoever. Hi, Sam. Hey, Joan. Joan was a clerk at an aerospace firm in Houston. Sam Patel also worked there as a software engineer, but he had much bigger plans. Well, talk to you about a new business I'm getting involved in. It's the company would be called Houston, Best Vegas. Aviation, a commuter airline for gamblers. I've got a few investors, but I think I'll need you for public relations. When Sam initially offered this position to my mother, she was, of course, flattered and excited because the money was very good. Now, this file I have set up for all correspondence. Patel hired Joan to help start the company. She was also on its board of directors. Come to it any time and you can find whatever. Though Patel was married, he and Joan often met at the home of his girlfriend. Sam had arranged marriage. Um, he had told me that he could not get a divorce, and so we lived as boyfriend and girlfriend. Thank you. You guys need anything? Patel told Joan that overseas investors would be funding Best Aviation within a few months. Meanwhile, he wanted to get life insurance for the company's key employees. Joan herself was insured for a quarter of a million dollars. The initial idea was presented from the investor group because they wanted assurances that if something happened to one of the key people in the organization that the company could function and that they would recover their investment. Basically, she's a uh, secretary, and uh, I, I can't see that as a key point person. It just didn't, nothing sounded right about that. Patel agreed to pay Joan a monthly salary. But in the next seven months, she received only one check, and that one bounced. Sam, I want out. Why, Joan? Because there's no money, Sam. Look, there's money now. Kelly claims that her mother wanted to quit, but Patel convinced her to stay. Me. It's all wrong. Joan, just be honest with me. Joan never approached me and said that she wanted to leave the business. There was a time when she said, hey, look, this isn't working out, and I don't like it. She did come up and say that, and, and the compromise we had come up with was fine. You can continue to be part-time um, until you feel comfortable, and we'll go out and get somebody else to work part-time also. OK? Please. All right. But by then, Joan's back wages totaled close to $4,000. Two weeks later, Patel showed up at her apartment late at night. 
You'll never believe what he just did. He brought the check. You have it? Well, no, I don't have it. He had to take it out and get it copied, but... She said that he oh, had to go weird. get this certified check Xeroxed, which was odd to her and me. Sam? Hi. Look, Joe and I, I drive, but I just couldn't find a Xerox machine, and I don't have a car, so I need to use the phone, please. Well, Patel I... told Joan that if he couldn't get a ride, that she should take him home. So I can get a ride home. Uh, Kelly, I've got to go. When she told me that he mentioned getting into her car, that, I think, was the firmest I have ever been with my mother, saying over and over, absolutely not. Do not ever let him in your car. According to Kelly, Patel showed up a third time. Oh, Kelly, it's Sam. Look, Sam, it's getting late. Go away. Just Look, I'll, I'll see you at work tomorrow. Patel says Kelly is wrong. I had never met Joan like that in the manner that Kelly had described to the police. Never, ever. I truly believe it was a trial run. And I think because I was on the phone and my mother continued to say, Kelly, it's Sam, I stopped it that night. Two weeks later, after a business dinner with Sam Patel, Joan Jeffries was murdered. Joan told Kelly that she planned to meet Patel and his wife Penny for dinner. Joan expected to get a check for her back wages. She also planned to hand over the company's files and sever her ties with Best Aviation. So, how are you doing? Fine. Where's Penny? I thought Penny was supposed to yeah, be here I'm sorry she didn't show up because uh, she had to work late, but I'm here. Patel insists that Joan was not planning to quit. How about you? Um, a Diet Coke. Okay, I asked care? Joan to meet with me. Oh. I can give you the check. You can give me files. We can arrange for our meeting with the investor group, for you to be there. And uh, that was the purpose of the meeting. And guess what I have for you? I've got you your check. Is it good? It will be in a few days. See, the money's being transferred. Patel and Joan left the restaurant together at about 10 p.m. But Joan never made it home. Hey, Charlie. Now, well, best I can tell, a couple of shots to the head, another couple to the chest. By 9 a.m., detectives were at the crime scene trying to piece together what happened. Then I saw this. Can you see that over there? Necklace. Joan's purse and keys were missing, but she was still wearing her gold and diamond necklace. Robbery did not seem to be the motive. Because of the multiple gunshot wounds to the body, it would indicate that the offender is known to the victim or, or had a grudge or, or something of that nature. Could you account for your whereabouts right after leaving the restaurant? What happened? What were your actions? Yeah, uh, we walked out in the parking lot. I spoke to her for 15, 20 minutes in the parking lot. I walked to her car. Um, she went home, and I went to my girlfriend's house. Now, at any time, were you in her car? No, sir. I was never in a car. Are you sure about that? Yes, sir. I'm positive. I've never been in a car, and I was not in the car last night. The first interview that we had with Sam Battelle, he told us that he had not been in Joan Jeffrey's car. Later, in a second interview, he changed his story and said that he had, in fact, been in Joan's car and that we would find uh, evidence of such in, in her car. Now, can you account for your movements after leaving the restaurant? Yes, I, when I went to my girlfriend's house, I uh, rode the bicycle for a few minutes. You rode the bicycle? Uh, yeah, around cul-de-sac for a few minutes. I guess your girlfriend will back you up on that. She sure can. What's her name? I opened the door and Sam was there with a shirt wrapped around his neck and I said, you know, what are you doing without your shirt on? You're, you know, it's cold out there. You're going to catch a cold. And he said, I've been riding my bicycle. I was hot. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't ridden a bike. I hadn't done any exercise in months and months. And, you know, I, I was going into the house. I took my shirt off, and I had it over me, and I was walking into the house. And that shirt has never been found. And I think it's a very crucial piece of evidence because he would have had to reach across Joan to take the keys out, and that shirt would have had a smear of blood all up the arm. There's no blood stains on it. I have it in my closet. And if whoever wants it, if the Webster Police Department would send me a real nice note saying, please, could we have the shirt, I would be glad to hand over the shirt to them. 
Investigators say that Patel has never been willing to give them that shirt. For Jones' family, Patel's refusal is just one more sign that he pulled the trigger. I think Sam is responsible for the murder of my mother because he had a life insurance policy out on her life for $250,000. She was ending her business relationship with him that night, so he needed to do it that night while she was still an employee. Patel insists that this accusation is completely groundless. The very next day after her death, uh, the board of directors uh, all got together, and we decided that we would take the entire proceeds from the insurance and A, either give it to the family, B, donate it to some local charity that would leave a lasting memorial for Joan, or a combination of both. The case of the killing of Joan Jeffries is still open. If you have any information about her murder, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Did they really die in a shootout in South America? Robert Leroy Parker and Harry Alonzo Longabout. In the late 1800s, these two men became the legendary outlaws known as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Paul Newman and Robert Redford starred in the celebrated film about their final days. The movie, like history, tells us that Butch and Sundance died in a shootout in South America. But some believe that Hollywood and history may be wrong. There is some evidence that Butch Cassidy returned to the United States and died of natural causes. Let's do this run. We're going to run over to the feet. Yes, Two years after Butch and Sundance were supposedly killed, a man named William Thaddeus Phillips arrived in Spokane. He opened a successful machine shop and became a very prominent businessman. Gentlemen, look good, look good. But oddly, Phillips was a man without a past. The first definitive record of William Phillips was his marriage certificate dated May 14, 1908. There is no other previous record of William Phillips. In the 1920s, about 1922, uh, the first reports began circulating in the West that Butch Cassidy had returned. People began to say that Butch Cassidy was William Phillips. Some see a resemblance between William Thaddeus Phillips and George Butch Cassidy. But if Phillips was Cassidy, then how did the outlaw escape from Bolivia? According to some historians, the account of how Butch and Sundance died can be credited to one man, Percy Siebert. Siebert had worked with the outlaws at a tin mine in Bolivia and became very friendly with them. Percy was the one who identified the two men killed in the shootout as Butch and Sundance. But Siebert may have deliberately lied. I believe that Percy told the story of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid's death in Bolivia to pay back what he felt was a debt of loyalty and friendship to allow these outlaws to begin a life under amnesty without a past. Larry Pointer is convinced that Butch Cassidy took on the identity of William Phillips. As Phillips, he returned to the Wyoming mountains where Butch and his outlaw gang had once roamed. We know of a man who went with Phillips to Wyoming in 1933. This man died recently, but we uh, have interviewed him. He was there all summer with Phillips, uh, and he met all the old timers uh, that Phillips met. And in almost every case, these old timers uh, accepted Phillips as Casty. But old timer stories are always the most interesting and the least reliable. Author Dan Buck has researched the life and death of Butch Cassidy and is convinced that William Phillips was 
an imposter. The William Phillips story is chock full of old timer tales. People that claim they were good friends with Cassidy and knew Phillips was Cassidy. And usually it's when asked by someone, when prompted by someone, uh, well, you were a good friend of Butch Cassidy's, weren't you? And of course the answer is yes. Who wants to say no? In Wyoming, Phillips met a woman named Mary Boyd Rhodes. In 1934, Mary and her 16 year old granddaughter, Ione, rode out to Phillips' campsite. The man that my grandmother met that day was going by the name of William Phillips, and she knew him by the name of Leroy George Parker, who is known as Butch Cassidy. Mary Boyd. He recognized her immediately, and she recognized him. Oh, George Parker. <laughs> I sensed that they had a relationship that I had never known much about. So my grandmother had finally told me that he was her childhood sweetheart. Three years later, Phillips mailed this ring to Mary. It was engraved, George C. to Mary B. William Phillips died soon afterwards. I believe William Phillips pretended to be Butch Cassidy because he was having fun. He traveled out to the West, he met some people, uh, he probably got some free beers. Uh, he certainly uh, got a lot of adventures out of it. But several other clues do suggest that Butch and Phillips were one and the same. Phillips wrote a manuscript called The Bandit Invincible, the story of Butch Cassidy. It contained specific details about Butch's adventures. Well, there's material in that manuscript that no one else knew that had never been published that either the man who wrote it had to have intimate knowledge of Casty, or uh, he was Casty. Phillips owned this six-shot Colt revolver. Carved into the pistol grip is a unique brand. That brand was the Reverse E Box E. That was Butch Cassidy's brand in the 1890s. The passing of a century has turned these two outlaws into legends, if not heroes. And we don't like our heroes to die. There seems to be at least some evidence that Butch Cassidy may have survived the shootout. But it was almost certainly the end of the road for the Sundance Kid. Next, a feud between two restaurant owners ends in murder. T.K. Hardy's Saloon was a popular bar and restaurant that attracted the university crowd in Athens, Georgia. The saloon's owner was T.K. Hardy. He rented space in a large complex of restaurants and shops. T.K. Hardy was an obnoxious Yankee when you first met him. He came on really strong, and when he came to town, it took me a little while to get used to him so that I would even want to have him as a tenant. Good. How you doing? Pretty good. When you got to know TK, he was just a real teddy bear, just a really nice guy. He was enthusiastic about the, the complex and doing it right. Hardy's rival was a man named John Mooney, who also leased space in the same complex. His restaurant was called Somebody's Pizza. Mooney and TK Hardy never really got along because both men were trying to attract the same customers. When John Mooney came to town, he was the preppy, out of college, cool guy. And that uh, lasted until he got the lease sign and got the place. Then John kind of got greedy. Hey, come see us next door, Nickel Beer, somebody's pizza. Come to somebody's pizza right next door. Good deal on beer. Nickel John started wanting to infringe on everybody else's business. His idea was to go up to TK's, pass out flyers on the deck for nickel beer, and draw TK's crowd down to his place. John, what do you think you're doing here? Hey, what does it look like? That just went all over TK. I mean, he couldn't stand it. That was the, the last straw. I'll tell you what this is. This is private property. I want you out of here right now. 
John Mooney and T.K. Hardy despised each other. They really had gotten to the point that there was no reconciliation between the two people. After three years of feuding, T.K. Hardy finally got the upper hand. He was able to lease the entire complex and evict John Mooney from his restaurant. After that, their feud escalated into a full-scale war. This is your eviction notice. Eviction notice? This is your eviction notice. You're out of here. Ten days later, TK arrived home in the early morning hours after closing up his saloon for the night. Someone was hiding in the shadows of his kitchen, watching him. When TK went into his study, the man followed. Then he shot TK once in the head. TK died instantly. Four hours after TK's body was found, police picked up Mooney for questioning. John, do you know why you're here tonight? Why? Well, I guess it's about the shooting of uh, T.K. Hardy. Yeah. How did you know about the shooting? I told him that we had not released that information and that nobody knew that except the police department and the people that were investigating this murder, that he had been killed or how he had been killed. Uh, at that time, he did become nervous. Uh, he said, I think I need to talk to my lawyer. All righty, thanks. Bye. Hold on just a second, sit down. When he hung up the phone, he said, my lawyer said for me to get up and walk out if I wasn't under arrest. I'm going to allow you to leave. I want to tell you something before you go, though. At the time, police You're did not, not have enough right. evidence to arrest Mooney. You're my man. Go ahead. After three weeks, they were still at a dead end. And then the police got a lucky break. Another restaurant manager called with a bizarre story. He said he was cleaning up behind the bar one night when an Atlanta electrician named Elmo Florence offered him his services as a hitman. You're a what? I'm a hitman. You don't need to call New Jersey. If you want somebody good, give me a call. Well, Elmo was bragging to me about the fact that he was a hitman and that his services were for hire. At first, I thought he was kidding me, that he had murdered T.K. Okay. Hardy. And then we started to go on, and, you know, I said, all right, how'd you get in the house? Piece of cake. Busted out the glass. Elmo Florence began to describe the inside of the house, where the murder took place. He began to tell the point of entry what type of weapon was used to kill Ted Hardy. He told where the bullet entered the head and where it exited. Basically, in the statement that we received from the manager of the restaurant, there were 21 different points that we had not released uh, to the public. We knew at that time that we had a very hot suspect here. Mr. Florence. Yeah. Elmo Florence. That's right. You're under arrest. Florence had told the restaurant manager that John Mooney hired Florence to kill TK. But when the police went to arrest Mooney, they couldn't find him because he left the country. A few weeks later, police were tipped off that Mooney had returned to the States and was staying at a friend's apartment. They went there and approached two men who were drinking in the parking lot. When I saw the two individuals drinking beer, this gave me a perfect out. I figured to approach them from this angle. Hey, all these cans here, it kind of upsets me, all this litter. You know, Officer Moss things. recognized one of the men as John Mooney. i tell you what, just put your hands on the car. Mooney was arrested and charged with murder. Among his belongings, police found several incriminating notes that he jotted to himself. C. Elmo offered to him, if worse comes to worse, to take the whole rap and say robbery was the motive. We have agreement for me to take care of his wife and family. Elmo Florence's trial lasted only one week. He was sentenced to life at a maximum security prison 
in Georgia. John Mooney was also sentenced to life, but he ended up in a minimum security facility. After six months, prison officials gave Mooney the job of kitchen clerk. Now he had access to areas that most prisoners did not. How's the count today? Pretty good? 245, 245. John Moody was what you call an ideal inmate. He didn't complain about the rules and regulations. He just worked hard. And he gained the confidence of the staff and myself. Now we see he was a con artist, and he was conning us all. After serving only 19 months of his life sentence, John Mooney engineered his escape. When the prisoners went back inside and the guard locked the gate and walked away, Mooney made his break. A getaway car was waiting. As Mooney ran to it, he threw off his uniform, piece by piece. Two hours later, prison officials realized that Mooney was missing. But by then, it was too late. Mooney had made his escape. Without the actions of Mooney and actually hiring somebody to take another person's life, T.K. Harder would be here today. Unless John Henry Mooney is captured, he got away with murder. Update. Within just minutes of our broadcast, two viewers reported that John Mooney was living in this house in Scottsdale, Arizona, under the name Robert J. Kelly. He was immediately arrested. Mooney had been enrolled at Arizona State University and was working as an accountant. He was married and had a one-year-old son. John Mooney was returned to prison in Georgia. He served his time and has been released. Next, a young boy says that his house is haunted. Even after an exorcism, the ghosts remain. Manchester, Connecticut. The Jones family says the haunting started without any warning. I ran upstairs. Michael! I thought maybe he had cut himself. I really didn't know. Michael? And there was Michael just curled up like it was a fetus. I mean, he was just frightened and shaking and, and crying hysterically, something I've never seen him do. Michael Jones told his mother, Denise, that he had seen a man in his room. But it was not an ordinary man. He was standing in front of me, and he reached out to me, and he was smiling, and then he just disappeared. He touched my shoulder. He was white, like the crayon color white. He said he was a ghost. I thought maybe something was wrong with Michael. I can't say I didn't believe in ghosts. I just never experienced something, so I never thought it would happen to us. Soon after Michael saw the ghost in his room, he was with his family visiting his grandmother. I was in the kitchen talking with my parents when Michael started screaming again. Mom! He says, Mom! that's the man, that's the man. I says, Michael, what is the man? He says, that man up on the wall in the picture, that's the man I see. I saw the picture, and I, I got scared because that was the man that, uh, that I saw. The man in the picture Michael was pointing to was my grandfather, who had passed away when I was 10 years old. Michael had never met him. It was the first time that Michael had ever seen a picture of his great-grandfather. So I felt safer that it wasn't like a bad person that was going to hurt me. And my mom said not to be afraid of him because he was a good man. And she said not to be afraid of ghosts because they can't harm me. Denise had no idea what to do. Her son kept saying that he was being visited by her grandfather's ghost. And to make matters worse, Michael now said that evil spirits were also invading their home. And I asked him um, what these things wanted from him. And I told him to talk to Grandpa. Grandpa will protect him. Grandpa said that some of the bad people want me on their side. When I talked to my grandpa, he just said that there's a, there's a lot of ghosts in our house that are after me. And there's a lot of bad ones and good ones. 
and they're all fighting with each other. Denise says that she took Michael for dozens of medical tests, hoping to get some answers. They all say it's not medical. They realize it's very bizarre that Michael is a ghost boy. He sees ghosts, and there's nothing medically they can do. Feeling desperate, Denise asked a paranormal specialist to examine both Michael and her home. It's very important to be able to go in and determine that it is something supernatural that is occurring in the home. John Saffis has been a paranormal investigator for 26 years, and he has studied dozens of similar cases. He spent many, many hours with Michael, researching Michael's sightings firsthand. We usually have to go through all types of different evaluations, psychological, physical. I really would like it documented and known that there isn't anything physically or mentally wrong with these people that are going through this. Michael's psychological profile also showed nothing unusual, but his drawings of a ghost he calls the Black Shadow Man told another story. Every day I see him, it's not really just the same shadow man, it's just like a bunch of different ones. I don't know why I see ghosts, all this is happening to me. Zaffis learned that when Michael was born, his heart stopped 26 times. My explanation is that he had near-death experiences. I believe since birth, he's had that ability where that door has been open for the spirit to be able to communicate back and forth with him. And I think it is at the point where it is trying very, very hard to be able to totally take Michael over. Denise was concerned that the bad spirits might be winning. One time, me and my husband were downstairs when all of a sudden we were listening to banging upstairs. We heard him scream and we heard a thumping. And so we ran upstairs. And Michael was on his bed like a little boy scared. His bed was shaking up and down. The bed started shaking a lot and it lifted up like three inches and I just yelled for my mom. Oh my and then dropped and it stopped shaking. We all ran out of the house because we needed to get a break from the house because it's very scary in there. Michael now said that the evil spirits were physically tormenting him. Everything started getting worse, and they started hitting me and scratching me and poking me, and it, it hurt. Usually when there's a physical manifestation, scratches, bite marks, this is definitely a sign that something is either attached to that individual or it has some way gained access. And at that point is where it could be very, very vulnerable where that person could go completely under possession. To protect her son from the intruders, Denise sold their home and moved the family across town. But the new house was no better. I was on the phone with my mother. Michael was sitting right next to me watching TV when all of a sudden he started screaming. He just looked at my brother, and he just saw like a scrape going all the way up his arm, and it, like it was drawing blood. Blood. Michael. I felt a sharp pain, like a knife, but it hurt really bad. After this incident, we needed someone who dealt with this, and I was able to find the bishop who agreed to give the exorcism. Denise felt that an exorcism was the only way to save Michael. They started performing an exorcism uh, in Latin. I could tell there was something wrong with Michael. He kept looking to one side of the church. And I saw the, the shadow man in the front left corner of the room of the church. I could see his whole body and his feet. And he was just standing, and he was all black. And my stomach started burning, and I told the priest, and he gave me holy water and said, drink this. I was praying to God that it was going to work and help, and that Michael B. might be granted some relief. Although we were told it might not be the end all, it might have to be repeated. There may need to be a house exorcism. And they were right because about three weeks later, it all began again. 
Over the next few years, Michael underwent four exorcisms and his family moved eight times. But the improvement was always temporary. We just live one day at a time. It hurts when I see my son going through this. I don't know what to do. Do I see a brighter future for Michael and the family? Absolutely. There's many of families that go through this, and it's very difficult. And it's like the old saying goes, it's always the darkest before the dawn. Pretty much everything's been hard for me. So everything that's happened has been hard. Now I'm getting used to it. Next, a hired farmhand turns out to be a killer. It's the same height, same build. He's a big guy and he's a hot-tempered guy. This is the guy, man. I'm telling you, this is the guy. The this guy call to our phone center led to the arrest of an accused killer. He'd been on the run for more than a year, hiding behind half a dozen aliases. You may remember him as David Freeman. Freeman was hired as a handyman by a Pennsylvania farmer named Tim Good. Freeman considered himself something of a preacher, and he used his sermons to slowly gain control over Tim Good. Say, Tim, I was wondering, I'm going to be leading a Bible study up at the house later this evening. Thought you might like to come up and check it out. By what time? Tim became a believer. When he sold his farm for a million dollar profit and moved to West Virginia, Freeman followed. Hey Tim, how about when you're done with that, clearing some more of that land over by the fence? Within a few years, the role reversal was complete. Why don't you get some of that wood over there for kindling? Freeman gave the orders, Tim obeyed them. Better clear as much as you can. You know the Lord says, the man that doesn't work doesn't eat. Please bless this food. Tim became a prisoner in his own home. He lived in a basement cell while Freeman and his family lived comfortably upstairs. He indicated what chores Timothy Good was to perform that day. He even indicated what Timothy Good was to eat that day, if he was allowed to eat that day. Every aspect of Timothy Good's life was controlled by Dave Friedman. I'm studying, man, like you told me to do. Is that what I told you to do? Is there anything else I told you to do, Tim? Police believe that Freeman eventually strangled Tim and left his body in the basement. Yesterday? Yesterday? Investigators discovered the badly decomposed body months later. By then, Tim's million dollar bank account had been reduced to two dollars and Freeman was long gone. Update. I'll take you right to the guy. The guy ripped me off in the first place. He got me for like over a thousand more than what he told me he was going to get, and then, then he got all upset because I got upset because... The viewer who called said that he knew Freeman as George Jelks, an auto mechanic. When I realized that it was a valid tip, I was pretty excited. I've been chasing this subject for a year and a half, and once I finally knew that I, he was within grasp, it was almost too good to be true. Within hours, police staked out Jelk's apartment. When he came out of the house, we could tell that this was a suspect. He matched the description. Four children were in the apartment, so police waited for Jelk's to leave. And then they made their move. After he was arrested, police discovered that Jelk's real name was William David Cooper. He pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. We recently told you about a vicious armed robber who left his victim severely disabled. But thanks to a viewer's tip, this robber is now in custody. Richmond, Virginia. Shortly after midnight at a McDonald's restaurant, assistant manager Mark Clavoon and truck driver Perry Duncan were unloading supplies. Mark had recently moved to the area with his wife and three children. All right, you guys, we got uh, two more after this. Two more, and then we can go. 
four other employees were in the basement store. Hey, now we're gonna go inside and open up the safe. No, don't shoot. Hey, send some more napkins down your lighter. Mark Clavoon was shot once in the forehead at point-blank range. He didn't die, but he will never be the same. He suffered some severe brain damage and paralysis on the left side. He has regained use, partial use of his left leg, but he has no use of his left arm at all. And no matter what happens as far as apprehending these two individuals, it cannot outweigh the suffering that this family's gonna go through for the rest of their lives. Police learned that the gunman had fled on foot and that later they tried to steal a car from a woman in a nearby residential area. She had just arrived home and they attempted to accost her and take her keys away from her. They were identified by her as wearing the same type of clothing uh, as the situation at the restaurant. She was able to get away from them and run into the house. The next morning, police made a surprising discovery only a few yards from the woman's house. The robbers had left behind their ski masks and gloves, as well as a 357 revolver. The weapon was traced to a convicted murderer named Michael Anthony Starr, who had been paroled from a Virginia prison only the year before. Update. Thanks to a viewer tip, police arrested Michael Anthony Starr he was convicted of attempted robbery and two weapons violations. He was sentenced to 45 years in prison. He served his time and has been released.